Good morning, everyone. I think people are still joining us, so we'll let that continue to populate, but we'll get started since it is 10. I'd like to welcome you to Creating an Oasis for Yourself and Others, which will be a wellness presentation um, for UC a &R statewide program personnel and volunteers. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Marissa. Good morning, everyone. I want to share a few Zoom logistics. If you're having trouble hearing us, I'm going to give you a few different options that may um, help you have better audio connectivity. So one option is to click the join with computer audio button on your Zoom window. This is a window that automatically uh, appears when you join the Zoom meeting. Another option is to go back to your registration confirmation that has your Zoom link. So this is the email that you clicked on this morning where it says click here to join. And there's some dial in phone information down at the bottom of that invitation. So that's another option for you. Finally, you can turn up your external speakers on your computer or iPad or phone, wherever you're joining us from, or you can use headphones. And finally, if you still can't hear us, don't worry. This webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to the UC Master Gardener Program YouTube channel as well as the UC 4-H Youth Development YouTube channel. So you'll be able to find us there and we encourage you to share that link when it's available uh, widely with anyone that you think might be interested in, in this project. If you have a question for one of our panelists today, I want you to know that our, our chat function has been disabled. We have a lot of folks on this call today and more that are joining as I speak, but we do have a Q&A function. So when you click the Q&A box, you'll be able to ask questions to panelists for them to be addressed during the last portion of this meeting today, where a few of our panelists will be able to, to field questions from attendees. So that function is available to you, the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. As Gemma mentioned, we welcome you to creating an oasis for yourself and others. This is a wellness webinar, both for statewide program personnel and for volunteers. And we'll talk a lot more about our agenda in just a moment, but I wanna get a sense of who's in our Zoom room today. So I'm gonna launch a poll that's gonna ask you to identify if you are a staff person, an academic, which program, statewide program you're affiliated with, um, or if you're a member of the community, if you're a community partner, or if you don't fit into any of these categories. So feel free to click as many as apply to you if you're affiliated with more than one program. We encourage you to do that. And I'll leave this open for a few more minutes. I also want to put in a plug for a survey that will be distributed to folks automatically after you close out of this meeting. It's optional. You're not required to complete that survey, but that's going to ask in a little bit more detail um, about your affiliation and also how you might utilize some of the information that's shared in this meeting today. I'm going to leave this open for about 20 more seconds to allow a few more folks to enter their information. And thanks to all who have already. And I want you to see what I'm seeing, which is that the UC Master Gardener program is very well represented in this meeting, but we also have some representatives from other statewide programs. Welcome all of you. And I'm going to turn it back over to Gemma to um, introduce me and herself. <laughs> okay. So good morning. Um... As Marissa mentioned, I'm Gemma Miner. I am the Academic Coordinator for Volunteer Engagement with the Fort Juice Development Program. And the Marissa is Academic Coordinator for Volunteer Engagement with the UC Master Gardener Program. So we have dual positions serving volunteers and our staff and academic personnel within UC a r to advance volunteerism. So we are glad you're, you're joining us today. We're really thrilled to put this agenda together and we'll carry on with the going over the agenda right now. And yeah, so we're doing the welcome now, of course. And then the first speaker on our panelists is Anne Yacopucci. Uh, we'll, she'll be talking about mindfulness. Marcel Horowitz will be talking on planning for happiness. And Missy Gable will be talking on therapeutic horticulture. We'll do a little closing. We'll do some post-meeting Q&A. And we'll make sure that we get to all the questions that you pose in the Q&A box if you have questions that come up. And then post-meeting, we'll actually be um, posting this on our YouTube channels. And I think we'll talk about that at the end, about where you can access the webinar after the fact. Okay. So I wanted to, um, the poll is still in the middle of my screen. There we go. Sorry, the poll box was in the middle of my screen. I didn't know why it didn't go away. I think I had to make it go away. 
So we wanted to go over just a little bit about just giving us, you know, grounding us in what UC ANR is. We use that acronym UC ANR to stand for University of California Agricultural and Natural Resources, which is our division. And then there are, our office is located in Davis, as most of you know, but there are 50, 58 UC Cooperative Extension offices in every county across the state. There are nine research and extension centers within UC ANR, six statewide institutes, and six statewide programs. So today, the statewide programs that we're primarily reaching are 4-H, Master Gardener, and Master Food Preserver. So, but there are three others in addition to those. So it's just understanding the scope, the depth, and the breadth of what UC ANR does. It's pretty amazing the amount of outreach and community support that we provide across the state for all kinds of things related to agricultural and natural resources. And then as I mentioned, the UC ANR programs that we're representing today are Master Gardener, 4-H, and Master Food Preserver. And annually, we serve over between the three, those three programs serve 26,000 volunteers across the state of California, which is a pretty impressive amount. So we're happy to see 300 of you joining us today. And then we want to talk a little bit about the title of our event today. And so in grounding us in what is an oasis, as we talked about what are we going to name this, the oasis kept coming up and, there, and it resonated with us. We hope it did with you too. But an oasis is a fertile spot in the desert where water is found, these are the definitions, or a wet green habitat for plants and animals. But it's also a fertile, a place of abundance, a place that offers quiet and solitude, and a place that provides for one's basic needs. So that, that's the part of the definition that we really are focusing on today and hope that kind of grounds us in what an oasis is and what we're trying to accomplish today in our presentation. We also want to honor the work of, of other experts in the field of volunteer engagement and community engagement. And this term oasis, this quote that I'm sharing with you right now, we, didn't, we need an oasis in the midst of crisis and a destination afterward, comes from Spitfire Strategies founder and um, CEO Kristen Grimm. And during a presentation to experiential and environmental educators, she shared this idea that that in the midst of uncertainty, we need a, a place where we can ground ourselves, that place of of solidarity and solitude, and we need a destination. We need a place to go, something that we can do, both with our bodies and, and our minds. So we at the University of California Ag and Natural Resources believe that this is absolutely true. We agree, we agree with this statement. We all need an oasis and a destination, and we know that we are all coping with new kinds of challenges in this particular moment. And as Gemma mentioned, coping and stress have been big themes. How do we leverage our resources to address these, these challenges and these questions? So whether you're volunteering more because the volunteer efforts of other volunteers have been have shifted because of all of the needs that have arisen in this moment, or whether you need to step back because there are a lot of demands on your time, we hope that some tools we'll be able to share with you today will provide you with some options, a, a suite of, of options in order to create your own space of abundance and, and solitude. And we acknowledge that this crisis, this, this era of COVID-19 and coronavirus and all of the related impacts are affecting everyone differently. So there are challenges that this presentation is, is simply not going to be able to address. And there are some strategic uh, issues that we need to be working on long-term to address some of the structural challenges that, that prevent people from being successful and healthy and safe in this moment. So um, we know that, that this webinar is not gonna be able to cover everything, but we're really proud of the work that our academics and staff are doing um, to provide provide people with that peace and oasis in this moment. And we're really proud of the, of the panelists that you're going to hear from today and think that what they have to offer is, is really relevant and timely. So you're going to hear from three speakers today, and I'll turn it over to Gemma to introduce us to the first speaker. And I want to give a, a big thank you to them before we even begin. So much appreciation. I know that everyone is joining us from perhaps an environment that isn't usual for them, and that's the case for our speakers as well. So we really appreciate you carving out this time to share with our volunteers and staff and academics. All right, so it's my pleasure to welcome Anna Iacopucci, who's an academic coordinator at the University of California. And her work focuses on developing, organizing, and evaluating health programming in extension. She has many hobbies that include running, playing music, and cooking. However, most of them have taken a back burner as she's primarily 
occupied with chasing her four-year-old son around and she's loving every minute of that but it speaks to that whole um how this the pandemic has impacted many of us as we try to manage and balance working at home and also managing our families and yeah so Anne's going to talk about being mindful in that space and you're muted hun. There we go. Okay, we go. my goodness. All right. So uh, thank you, Gemma. Uh, yes, my name is Ann Yakupuchi, and I um, primarily work on um, healthy living programming in um, our youth programs and extension, so in 4-H and in our nutrition education program. And over the past few years, um, myself and a subset of colleagues have really been looking at this idea of mindfulness and how mindfulness can help boost our physical, social, emotional health. Um, so I'm thrilled to be presenting some of the science behind mindfulness and how mindfulness can promote healthy people and healthy communities. Um, when, you know, we think about the, the term mindfulness, it's becoming much more popular these days, um, and we, we hear it a lot more in, in the past several years. So I want you to just take a minute and think about when you hear the word mindfulness, you know, what do you, what do you think of? I want to invite you just to um, kind of reflect on your own definition of mindfulness. So some, um, you know, may have thought of things like yoga or being in the moment. Um, most of those things are all part of uh, a mindfulness. So um, we define mindfulness as noticing and being. Um, so defining mindfulness. Mindfulness is um, noticing and being aware. So being aware of yourself and what's around you, exploring the world with all of your senses. Um, openness and curiosity, being open to new experiences, uh, non-judgment, so being um, in the present moment and experiencing life without thinking about whether or not it's good or bad, and acceptance, so being content with the present moment. Some examples of mindful practice might be body scans, uh, paying attention to each part of your body and how it feels, uh, focusing first on your head and how that feels, then your shoulders, your knees, your toes, um, spending a moment thinking about each part of the body. Breathing exercises are another example where um, you monitor your breathing as a way to focus and connect your body with your mind, imagining lungs as balloons to breathe in air, prevent, um, pretend you're blowing up a balloon and releasing each breath. Walking meditation is another example, so taking slow, thoughtful steps is a way to focus and connect to movement and breath and the environment around you. So I'm sure as we talk more about um, the garden, uh, walking meditation will be um, a great way to connect the two of those. So uh, what does the research say about mindfulness? Why are we talking about mindfulness at the university, right? Um, current research has demonstrated that the importance of mindfulness training and promoting um, favorable social, emotional, psychological, behavioral, and academic outcomes for youth and adults um, is uh, prevalent. Mindfulness practices can demonstrate improved executive function, reasoning, and self-control, which is a skill necessary for us ma to maintain healthy behaviors. Research in mindfulness practice has shown increased mindfulness enhances the actual neurological structures in our brain that improve cognitive function and aid in self-regulation and decision-making. So mindfulness practices help reduce stress and anxiety and give us tools to cope with stress and, and anxiety that we experience. Mindfulness practice helps us feel more connected and express compassion and gratitude for others. And uh, mindful people are better able to focus and concentrate and making decisions, therefore show improvement in um, their health choices. So uh, mindfulness practices have been shown to assist in brain function, particularly in three regions of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. The prefrontal cortex is responsible for impulse control, problem solving, emotional regulation, and decision making. Practicing mindfulness increases activity in the prefrontal cortex, which can help improve our ability to make decisions, regulate emotions, problem solve, and control impulses. So just the act of engaging in these mindfulness experiences is changing the neurological structures, the way that we think and experience the world. 
Uh, next slide, please. The hippocampus is responsible for remembering and learning, so mindfulness practices increase the cortical thickness and can improve memory, learning, and one's response to stress. Next slide. The amygdala is the emotional center of the brain. Many of our anxious emotions are housed in the amygdala. The intense feelings um, that we have when we're presented with a high stress situation um, is due to activity in the, in the amygdala. And this is often referred to as the flight or fight response. So mindfulness practices can help restructure those connections in the brain by weakening the connection in the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, and therefore allowing stronger connections to be made to strengthen concentration and focus. Mindfulness actually reduces the size of the amygdala, which results in less reactivity to stress. Next slide. So mindfulness is, if mindfulness is so great, why don't we all just do it? Well, we get distracted. So, um, you know, if you've ever found yourself staring at a screen, forgetting what you were doing because you were thinking about something else, this is an example of not being in the moment, right? Mindfulness takes intentional practice and structure um, around setting intentions and goals for ourselves. Next slide. Being mindful is um, bringing awareness to everything that we do in our life. Next slide. So for a quick activity, you'll need to either open up a Word document or have a pen and paper in front of you. Um, I want you to write down um, all the thoughts that come to your mind, one, one line per thought. It's really important to consider our future, but often those thoughts can be worrisome, and looking into the past can often um, we'll focus on things that we can't change. So as you're creating your list, I want you to think about um, identifying each of these as either past, present, or future thoughts. I'll go ahead and do this with you. Let's take just a moment. Okay, so on my list, okay, I can't really see it, but I'll read it to you. Um, I've got four things that I just, uh, thoughts that popped into my head. One, uh, Dean's school. So my son's school is currently closed. When they open, I'm worried about whether or not I should let him go. Um, the second thing that popped into my head was the meaningfulness of this presentation, right? Is this uh, helpful and meaningful to the participants? The third thing was my husband has a pinched nerve in his back and was complaining about that this morning. And so I'm worried about him and worried about his ability to care for our son for the rest of the day. And then I have a, a, a large deadline today for a grant that's due. So I'm, I'm thinking about that. So on each of those items, what I want you to do is either label them as a P for a past, a thought that's consuming something in the past, an N for a now, something that's happening in the present moment, or an S for something that's the future. So for example, I'm concerned about Dean school, that's gonna be an F, that's a future worry. Meaningfulness of the presentation, that's a now, that's a now thought, uh, we're currently here. Um, Dan, Back is probably a past, and grant due date is a future, right? So out of those four thoughts that popped into my head, only one was really in the present moment, right? So this week, try to keep your focus on the here and now and enjoy each moment while you're engaged in it. So as you kind of take inventory of where uh, your thoughts are um, and, you know, identify whether or not it's uh, you, you've got a lot of thoughts focused in the past, in the present, or in the future. Um, and, you know, where do you see your thoughts mostly focused? How might you increase your now thoughts for the rest of the week? So take a minute and write down one strategy that you'll use to stay focused in the present moment. Okay. Yeah, that's the right one. Um, 
So I just wanted to give a, a moment to provide you with some of the resources that are available through the university around mindfulness. So the University of California 4-H Healthy Living um, program is really focused on providing learning opportunities that address health in the holistic sense, so the physical, social, emotional, and mindfulness practices really do connect each of these domains. So um, we have developed a curriculum for children ages five to eight that introduces them to mindfulness concepts, mindful eating, affirmations, identification and moods and emotions, being present in the current moment and yoga. And this uh, curriculum is available through the uh, 4-H online. We've also, um, next slide, developed um, some videos that are available uh, through eExtension for free. So in light of the shelter in place orders, we've developed this virtual component uh, where youth can participate in adapted lessons and have um, book readings um, that are all around topics of mindfulness. So these videos are available through eExtension, our learning management system, and are offered to youth and families um, in California for free. We also have the um, uh, annotated bibliography of children's literature. So uh, this resource and links here can take you to several books, uh, children's books that are all about mindfulness. And next slide. And um, for those leading 4-H projects, we have the 4-H Mindfulness Project Sheet that provides suggestions for scaffolding programming from beginners to advanced. And we also offer training um, in delivering a yoga project as well as first aid youth mental health training. And that is it. So if you've got um, questions, it looks like this slide um, gives you the link to the e-extension and the Enrollment Key California for um, the uh, virtual mindful me lesson. Great. Thank you, Anne, so much for sharing yep. your insights on mindfulness and good luck with your grant writing today. I know you're going to stick around for a little while. So, All right. So then it's my pleasure to introduce Marcel Horowitz. And Marcel is the Healthy Youth Families and Communities Advisor for Yolo County. She spent the last six years focusing her professional development by doing grounded theory research in the area of positive psychology, although we call her the happiness advisor. <laughs> and I think she's going to talk a lot about that today. So it's a positive psychology is a fancy way of saying she read a lot of books, took a bunch of classes, and listened to a myriad of talks while schlepping her overstuffed beat up SUV from campsite to hostel to yurt across the Western United States to find out what makes people and places happy. So Marcel, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jenna. I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Um, I just want to start off by saying, what do I mean by happiness? Because a lot of times I use that word and people go, oh, isn't that kind of cute? Um, but what I'm talking about is this sense of positive psychology is what they call it sort of in the, in the academic field. And there's been a whole slew of work on depression and negative psychology, and only recently have people started to think that, hmm, maybe we should look into what makes people go to the positive side of their emotions. So when I use the word happiness, that's really one of the only words that we have to describe a positive mental state. We have a whole slew of them in the English language for sad and depressed and anxious and unhappy. We only have a few for happy, joyous, blissful, and usually when we think of those things, we're thinking that we're smiling all the time and we're in a great mood. And that's not really what I'm talking about. because That's just not realistic and not how our brains work. What I'm talking about is just a sense of contentment, a sense of peace, um, and really to just not be on that negative side of your emotions on a daily basis. Um, this is definitely very relevant right now. I know that I'm struggling on a daily basis to balance the news feed uh, with my own internal dialogue of, of where things are in the world. So all we're hoping for is wherever you're at, so that we can get you a few steps closer, closer to being happy and content. Um, we have found that happiness is really important. So it's not just about, I want you to feel good and have a great life, which I do. Uh, but actually people that are happier do better at work. They do better at home. They're more creative. They're more patient. They're better at problem solving. And so there's really uh, a universal need for people to be in a better mood because we get a better society when we do that. I'm afraid to touch it. Let's see. There we go. So what we're going to need um, is another piece of paper. 
And I'm going to want you to take this piece of paper and fold it into quadrants, right? So fold it in half, fold it in half again, so that you get your four sections. Um, any kind of paper will work. If you don't have paper or a piece of scratch paper, it doesn't have to be blank and pretty and white. You can use the notes feature on your phone or use a Word document or just something because um, you are going to be writing a few things down. So you're also going to want a pen or a pencil or something to write with um, if you want to grab that. All right. So in the first thing we're going to talk about, is how much of your happiness do you think is predetermined? So think about that for a minute. How much of your happiness do you think is just a matter of your own biology? You have no control over it. It just is what it is. So I'm going to launch a poll. It's going to ask you what percent. Do you think it's 90%, 75, 50, 30, or 10? So how much of your happiness is predetermined? Some of you are over there Googling the answer to trying to find out the right one. No cheating. Think what you think. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll right now. Share the results. Okay, so most of you think it's somewhere in the middle, right? 50% looks to be about the average of what you think it is. So you might be surprised that indeed, oh, we keep screwing this up, Marissa. Only 10% of your happiness is predetermined. Let that sink in for a minute. All of the stress you're feeling, all of the anxiety you're feeling, all of the chaos is 90% within your control. Now, that doesn't mean you can control the world. That doesn't mean you get to stop the crazy stress that's out there. What it does mean is that you do actually have control over your own thoughts and that your thoughts are what control your emotions. So when we thought about today what might be helpful for you at home, I'm all about the plan. So it's great to have information, but it's really important to have action because that's what's going to make a difference in your life. So if I was doing my sabbatical work, and as you can see, if you can't see me, I've got a bookshelf behind me, and I read a ton of books, right, on all of, all of the aspects of things that can make people feel better. Like, it's nice to hear about it, but how great is it that I actually get to spend my life actually trying to do those things and helping myself to be happier? So we're going to do a few things so that you maybe have some action items on how you can be happier. All right, so now that you've got your piece of paper, I want you to write in one of the top corners the word pride. So one of the things that we have found is that different cultures maybe have different things that make them happy. And so as we study happiness around the world, it's not necessarily the same for every person in every culture, just like anything else. And this is actually one area at first I was really hesitant to embrace because I thought, well, we're talking about greed and vanity and all of these really negative things. But to a small degree, those do bring us happiness. The day when I get up, right, and I do my hair, I feel a little better about myself. I'm a little happier. The day I get my house clean and all my teenager stuff put away and the kitchen counters are like, you know, nice and neat, I feel a little better about myself. My mom's coming to visit and I scrub the baseboards in the dining room so they look good. I'm a little happier. But everybody has a different sense of what makes them happy. So in that piece of quarter of your piece of paper, write down a few things that make you feel successful or good about yourself. So what is something that makes you either feel successful or good about yourself? I mentioned, you know, a clean house, nice decor. Um, I have a ch child, so raising a, a well-rounded child is a sense of pride for me. Um, many of you are gardeners, right, so your beautiful garden. Um, being able to grow that one plant nobody else could grow might be a sense of pride for you. 
Um, you might have a skill like cooking or painting that brings you some sense of pride, whatever it is. It can be a million different things. Just jot a few of those down. Okay. In the next quadrant on your paper, I'd like to write the word purpose. So this is the next sort of area that I discovered when I was reading everything and studying everything that really gives people a sense of happiness or some, you know, a positive effect. So I want you to think about in your life, what are some of the things that give you a sense of meaning? And once again, this can be different for every person. But as you're thinking about it, usually it's something that involves somebody else. It could be greater society as a whole. It could just be your dog that wants to go for a walk. So what is something that motivates you to get out of bed? Uh, what is something that maybe you would sacrifice money for? What's the charities you're willing to give to or the items you're willing to buy for others? And I find for myself that I've really figured that out, this out on what angers me most in others. When I'm watching the news or reading my Facebook feed, when am I getting really upset with others because maybe they're infringing on what I think is, is a purposeful endeavor. And if you're struggling with thinking about something, think about something you might like. Um, if you don't really currently feel like you have a sense of purpose, what is something you might be able to add to get to that? All right, in your next quadrant, I'd like you to write down the word physiology. And this is maybe where I've spent most of my time thinking about how the way that our body works impacts our mind. There's, you know, obviously a connection. Um, Anne was talking about mindfulness, and last night as I'm laying in bed with my heart racing, thinking about all the future things that could go and possibly could happen, thinking, okay, I have control over this right now. If you change my thoughts, then I can change my heart rate, I can change my breathing, I can change my body. And it works both ways. So before I started talking, I was taking some deep breaths. Okay, don't be so nervous, slow your heart rate down. Like, I can control those things. So here's the really creepy, I don't know, I'm going to say creepy, kind of like creeped me out a little bit when I was reading this, is that your emotions aren't some abstract cloud-like thing that's happening to you. Your emotions are physical molecules in your brain and body. So that there is actually a little thing going around when you're happy that can be held, weighed, measured, and quantified. And that when you have happiness, and you have happy emotions, you store those emotions in different parts of your body. And when you retrieve those emotions later, when you think back to a romantic evening you had or the smile of your baby, and you remember that, that in itself is also a physical property being held in your body. So that throughout your body, these, there's these little molecules running around that are little happiness molecules. And that those can actually intersect with your DNA. So they have found at the cellular level, when they get down to the DNA of your cells, there's this little end cap called your telomere that predicts disease and how long you'll live. And the more of that happiness you have, the longer those are and the longer you'll live. So that just, I don't know, that just amazed me that, that the feeling I have of happiness is a physical concrete thing that impacts the DNA myself. But there's lots of things that can then give you more of these feel-good hormones and feel-good molecules that are running around. Um, anybody that knows me knows that I am a proponent of sleep. Um, I don't know about you, but I am a grumpy person when I do not get my nine, I'm going to say nine hours of sleep a night. Um, so, you know, anytime you've ever been overtired, you've had a hard time falling asleep, you have let all the to-do lists pile up until 10 o'clock at night and you're trying to catch up, the next day you really pay for it. How do you know if you're getting enough sleep? Because people have different amounts that they need. If you're waking up in the morning without an alarm clock, you're doing good. If you are struggling every morning and fighting with that snooze button, you're not getting enough sleep. Start putting your bedtime 15 minutes earlier until you're waking up on your own. The next thing is eating. The food that we eat, we know, can directly impact the hormones in our body. and our. Uh, so we know that things like healthy fats, fish, um, liquid oils, nuts, avocados, actually improve our mood as the fruits and vegetables, which are, you know, the panacea for everything. And they've also showed a link between highly ultra-processed junk food, decrease your mood. So it's kind of ironic that usually when we're stressed, we go to those highly sugary processed foods. Uh, but in the end, they tend to make us uh, less happy. Moving is really important. So every day, I want you to be thinking about how can you move? What can you do with your body? 
Um, if you can stand instead of sit, I have a standing desk, so I move around when, I, when I'm working. You can walk instead of stand. If I can take a call outside on a walk, I'm doing that. Um, and the more you can move, the more of those feel-good hormones you'll have in your body. Sunlight, you need to be exposing yourself to sunlight every day. I'm forcing myself right now, lunch, lunch outside, so I know I'm getting my 15 to 30 minutes a day with no sunscreen um, so that my vitamin D levels are, are high. Nature and green space, I'm preaching to the choir here with all of you master gardeners on this call, uh, but I keep, I don't have a lovely garden, but I do keep plants nearby so that I can look at my nature and, and, and see the trees. And when I go on walks, I try to do mindful nature walks and notice all of the natural things. Um, and physical touch, that's kind of maybe one of the things we're missing right now with social isolation, but making sure that we can hug those that we can, we cuddle our pets when we can are more important. So thinking about those areas, I'd like you to think about maybe what you're struggling the most with right now. Now that you're socially isolating, you're maybe working from home, which of these areas is not something um, that you're getting to on a regular basis that maybe we should focus on a little bit tomorrow, the next day, the next week. So once again, those were adequate, adequate sleep, healthy eating, moving as much as possible, getting sunlight every day, exposing yourself to nature, and physical touch. All right, that last quadrant on your piece of paper, you're gonna write the word pleasure. And this is the easiest one to get, so this is why it's last, because most people, this is the easiest one to think of. So what do I mean by areas of pleasure? This might be a beautiful piece of art that you look at that brings you joy. This might be a lovely piece of music that just makes you want to get up and dance. Um, it might be prayer or meditation that makes you feel better about things. Laughing with friends, that's what I'm really missing right now, is hanging out with my girlfriends and laughing. Reading, painting, hobbies, these are all the things that would bring you pleasure. Um, so think about what are the things that bring you pleasure? Are you doing them right now? Have you been doing them for a while? And a lot of times the people really struggle because they are so service oriented and they're always doing for others and helping their families and volunteering and working. This is usually the category that maybe takes a back burner sometimes. Think back, what did you used to like to do? And maybe even think about it in the context of the social isolation. What could you be doing at home? Did you like to draw? Can you get out some pencils and paper and just leave those out for you so you start to draw a little more? So write a few of those things down. If you haven't heard the term flow before, <laughs> cat, I got a new puppy. He brings me joy. Uh, if you haven't heard the term flow before, it means when you're just sort of lost in time, right? When you get into something and you lose all track of time, that's a sense of flow. And that's oftentimes what you find most pleasurable. So when I'm talking with my girlfriends, hours can go by and I hardly even notice. Okay, so in each of those areas, you have some things. And I want you to think about which one has been the most neglected. So I'm going to launch another poll for you. And I'd like you to think about this personally. Which of these four areas, pride, purpose, physiology, and pleasure, have you been neglecting the most in your life recently? In other words, where can you maybe gain the most benefit for improving your happiness right now? because you just haven't found or made the time to focus on that. And after you answer that, I want you on your piece of paper to think about some real concrete things you can do tomorrow or the next day in those areas. So add it to your to-do list, add it to your schedule. Make that time for that 15 minute walk, make that time for that phone call to a loved one. Get out the pen and the pencils to start drying. Whatever it might be, go clean off the kitchen counters of all the junk that's making you crazy. What can you do in the next few days? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna close the polling and share. So it's pretty split, but it looks like that sense of purpose and physiology, right? It's always easy to, to forget the healthy foods, the sleep, the exercise. Um, and right now might be hard if your sense of purpose has been something outside of the house. Um, you know, if you've been volunteering out somewhere and you can't get out right now, that you might be struggling with that a little bit. So how else can you adapt that to help people still with the things that you're passionate about? 
All right, and just so you know that I am not, uh, I am not someone who preaches without doing. So this is actually was our to-do list for last week, um, and I had it divvied up into the four areas. Uh, the last one is screens for my teenagers. So we are very conscious of that, yes, you can have your screens because we know you love them, but there is a time that they get turned off at night because moderation, of course, with everything is crucial. Um, so I, I practice, and I will say it has helped me a lot over the years to implement more and more of these measures into my life. So hopefully it helps you. Thank you. Thanks, Marcel. That was a great presentation. I need, definitely need to up my game in the P's. All right, Marissa. Thank you so much, Marcel. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll echo that, that I have some ideas that I need to try to implement in the next week or so. I'm really excited today to introduce Missy Gable, who's the director of the UC Master Gardener Program, who's going to be speaking to us today about therapeutic horticulture. Uh, Missy Gable has been the director of the UC Master Gardener Program for over six years and has a real passion for providing people with opportunities to put their learning to work in their communities in a variety of different areas, whether it's pollinator habitat or uh, healthy landscapes that utilize native plants. Uh, Missy has a lot of great information to share. So we've talked about the mind, we've talked a little bit about the body and the immediate environment, and Missy's now gonna be talking to us about the environment outside of the home um, or maybe on your, on your doorstep. So I'll turn it over to Missy. Missy, you do have remote control, so um, you should be able to advance slides, but if you have trouble, just let me know and I'll, I'll take it back. Missy. Great. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you, Gemma. I'm glad to be here to talk about gardening and the benefits that we can derive from gardening. Now, this is applicable to everyone on this webinar. You do not have to be a Master Gardener volunteer. You don't have to be affiliated with the Master Gardener program. Um, I want to give you some information about how and why gardening specifically is a healing modality that I'd love for you to take advantage of right now. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna start um, by just going through a series of images. I'm gonna give each image just a couple seconds and um, my ask of you is that you just look at the image, appreciate the image, and then try to, you know, try to collect any feelings, um, both physical, and or emotional changes that are happening to you as you look at these pictures. Okay, next slide. Ahead, next slide. Oh, <clears throat> oh gosh. My slides hopped around very quickly there. I'm sorry, everyone, we all just have to be patient with each other as we learn these technologies and figure out how to work with them. I hope that you had a moment um, for your brain to capture those images um, and look at them. Uh, my question for you, I'd like you to think to yourself, did these pictures elicit any emotions for you? And if so, what were they? Um, so an emotional reaction, you may have been reminded of something from your childhood. Um, maybe something from your own garden, something you have eaten recently or when you were dining out pre-COVID shutdown. Did you take a deep breath at any point? <clears throat> Did anyone feel inspired or excited about their own gardening activities when they were given pictures with colors, with um, plant elements that maybe they have used or want to use in the future? Um, did your shoulders relax at all? I know that that was a quick exercise, but um, some of us may have had a physical reaction where our shoulders actually dropped back off the bench. So the big question is why do we experience these feelings and our changes when we have even just pictures of a landscape or environment? Yes, yes, your audio is a little bit garbled, so I'm not sure if, if there's something that you can control on, on your end. It was just the last few sentences that were hard to hear. I'm going to go no. ahead and advance the slide. I'm so sorry, everyone. I'll try to talk more slowly. That might help. All um, right. And if you have any other windows you want to close, it sounds like your bandwidth is um, decreasing. Mm, that is not a good sign. No. <laughs> All right. Okay, everyone. So the question is, why do we experience physical and or emotional changes or reactions when we 
even look at pictures of gardens and or landscapes. So gardening has intrinsic health benefits. And what we want to talk about here is the therapeutic benefits of gardening. We're not talking about horticulture therapy, which is actually a medical practice um, where a therapist, an individual who's trained um, in using horticulture and gardening to apply mental and physical um, therapies to people, that's, that is horticulture therapy. We're talking about simply how gardening has health benefits and why. And so I'm going to start at the beginning, um, wherever and whenever you believe that the first humans um, arrived on this planet, we know that those people had a close connection with plants. There was a people-plant connection that meant survival. For those people who were able to find plants, they were able to provide themselves and their family with food, water, and shelter. So plants, two humans, uh, e are survival. Plants mean survival. The vestige of that historical connection that we've had with plants is that when we are gardening, when we are outdoors, or even when we're just appreciating an image or a view through a window of a natural landscape, we have physiological changes that happen in our bodies and we report mental changes as well. So for all of these reasons today, we can use gardening as a mode for healing and introducing healing practices into our lives. Next slide, thank you. So we'll start with talking about physical health. <clears throat> when we are gardening, I think physical health is the easiest concept to talk about when we talk about health benefits of gardening. Um, when you're gardening, uh, think about that activity. You're bending, you're stretching your body, you're working on your joint health with those movements, you're working on your flexibility. Um, we often use um, applying gardening techniques like pruning and um, planting uh, with um, in, in skilled um, health facilities where people need to work on their fine motor skills. Um, maybe they're in occupational therapy. Uh, we can use gardening in those contexts because gardening helps to promote fine motor skills. Uh, gardening is considered a moderate physical activity for most people. Uh, so we do have research that shows that gardening over an extended period of time can actually ultimately lead to a decrease in BMI as well. So there are tremendous physical benefits um, to gardening and using it as a recreational activity. Other physiological changes that, happening, that happen when you're gardening, um, and this is also when you're simply viewing an outdoor landscape, your blood pressure goes down, your heart rate goes down, and muscle tension is also reduced. So really incredible changes that are happening. Those reductions that are happening internally also are a big factor in why we experience some mental health benefits to gardening. Next slide, please, Marissa. All right, so first and foremost, um, when it comes to mental health, I wanna share that people who garden report feeling happier almost immediately when they begin um, gardening and or using that as a therapy in their own lives. So gardening, the reason behind this is because gardening actually increases the serotonin hormone in your body, um, that's your happy hormone, and it decreases the hormone noradrenaline. Um, uh, Anne mentioned earlier the amygdala and the fight or flight response Noradrenaline is associated with the fight or flight response. And again, that hormone is decreased when you are gardening. Uh, a great example of these hormonal changes are actually from research uh, in prison gardens. In prison gardens, we see uh, a decrease in violent and physical tendencies between inmates who garden. We also see the highest rates of communication um, between individuals that have a different ethnic or race identification. We also see the highest rate of communication between different gang members or people with gang affiliations. The so really incredible benefits that are happening in these prison gardens. And a lot of that is attributed to this change in hormonal levels. Um, we can 
also look at the long-term impact of these prison garden settings. Um, I believe, I don't have my note right in front of me, but the, um, the statewide recidivism rate, I believe is approximately 67%. Um, but for those inmates who participate in gardening programs, the recidivism rate is only 10%. So it's a really incredible um, intervention that gardening can bring to those people's lives. Um, gardening also shows generally improved emotional well-being. When people garden, they report a reduction in mental fatigue, they report a reduction in stress, fewer mood disturbances, and then reduced feelings of anxiety. Uh, there was a recent study uh, that I saw this week that shows that gardening has a similar effect on the body as biking, walking, or dining out. And finally, gardening gives people, and I think most of us here can talk to this, um, they, it gives us a feeling of purpose, expectations for the future, um, enhanced productivity, it plays into happiness. As Marcel was mentioning, a lot of us find purpose um, uh, and, and pursue happiness through our gardening activities. Um, so these are just some of the mental health benefits uh, associated with gardening. Next slide, please, Marcel. All right, so looking to the future, what do we do with this information? We have a lot of gardeners on this uh, webinar right now. We may have a lot of non-gardeners, people who are interested in it. Again, when we talk about using garden as a mode for healing and creating healing interventions in your life, you don't have to be a great gardener. You don't have to have a self-prescribed green thumb in order to take advantage of this. Gardening can take place on a patio with one container um, with some soil and a plant. It can also take place on a large property. Um, please, I would encourage people to look at garden, gardening as an opportunity to introduce more healing activity into their lives right now. Um, so start or continue to garden. Again, it doesn't matter if you're in a rural or an urban environment. Um, it does not matter if you um, uh, don't have access to the traditional tools. Uh, you can see Master Gardener volunteers around the state have been posting ideas and examples about how people can introduce gardening into their lives um, by starting with non-traditional techniques. Uh, Lauren recently posted about how to start tomato seeds or uh, vegetable seeds, but in non-traditional containers like egg crates. Um, so look for what you have, take advantage of it, and start gardening. I would also encourage everyone here, we have a lot of Master Gardener volunteers, to start sharing with your neighbors. Uh, I know that we have to do this using social distancing guidelines. I recently harvested a huge number of herbs from my garden and started sharing them with the neighbors. Um, I simply dropped off mason jars full of herbs at people's doorsteps. And the response I got was really, um, really exciting for me personally as a gardener. Had a number of people reach out with questions about how they can grow their own mint um, or whatever herb it was that interested them the most. We exchanged recipes and I also had an opportunity to talk with them about my passion, which is um, gardening uh, under low water conditions. So it was a really exciting exchange. Um, do encourage other people around you as they ask you questions about your garden. Um, we have uh, a lot of social media presence right now where we're sharing tips and tricks for how to get people gardening. I think the shelter in place, um, we all know, many of us have heard, I think, that there's been an incredible resurgence in interest in food gardening. And this is valuable. Uh, this is meaningful. I'm thrilled to hear and see this. What I think, um, as informed individuals in the UC community, what we can also know is that by people introducing edible gardening into their lives, they're also introducing gardening as a healing modality by which they can cope with some of the stress and anxiety that we are all facing as we shelter in place, take on new jobs like, you know, headmaster at your homeschool um, and other such activities. So uh, I would encourage you to get to know more about the feelings that you're experiencing both physically and mentally as you're in your own garden. If you haven't been in your garden today, please do attempt to get out there and see what you can do to inspire yourself and others. All right, turning it back to you, Marissa. Thank you so much, Missy. 
So for current UC Master Gardener volunteers, just remember that continuing education opportunities are online and available. Check the UC Master Gardener statewide blog if you're looking for um, some new ideas and strategies to implement in your own garden. Um, and consider including some of these slides in the future if you're able to do a public education event, whether online or in person, uh, we'll be able to share these slides with you so that you can promote this research-based information about some of the benefits of gardening. For everyone, um, spending time in nature, as Missy mentioned, can have some of the same benefits as gardening. Um, so commit to spending time in nature or even better, reach out to your local UC Master Gardener program for resources and information about what's going to work well in your community. There's also information available across all of our blogs and social media, as, as Missy mentioned. So with that, Gemma and I want to say thank you <laughs> to our amazing panelists. Thank you to Anne. Thank you to Marcel. Thank you to Missy for sharing these strategies for um, creating an oasis for yourself and others. And of course, we're not talking necessarily about that physical oasis, but we're talking about creating that space of calm and that space of abundance within your own life, regardless of the resources that you have available to you in the moment. And we also want to thank all of you for joining us today. A recording of this event will be available on the UC Master Gardener Program and UC4H Youth Development Program YouTube channels. You're going to receive an automated uh, email at the close of this webinar that will contain a brief survey if you're interested in taking that. And you'll also receive an email in a couple of days when that YouTube video is posted to those various channels. So don't worry, it'll come into your inbox, but you can also use your, your Google search function in order to search for this video. And at this point, we're gonna close out the recording portion of the meeting. <music>